I've come to have a belief in destiny or fate because life is very strange and it unfolds in ways that you could never predict. Yeah. But, but I definitely, you know, you definitely have plans and those plans shape things. Welcome everybody to another episode of the Thinking Project podcast where we interview founders and creatives to help you take the next step in your business by listening to inspired stories of these wonderful founders. I hope you enjoy this podcast and make sure to share it with your friends. Thank you so much for tuning in. All right, Francis, thanks so much for being here. I know we kind of bounced around <laughs> a little bit on the timing, but I'm finally, we're finally doing it. I'm really glad to have you here. I'm excited. Yeah, absolutely. So um, right as we get started, um, tell us like what you do, like uh, what businesses you have going on, everything you're involved in. Sure. I'm the CEO of Invisible Technologies and Invisible is um, ops as a service. We make it really easy to delegate work. So you and your team can go on a Zoom call and screen share and show us any workflow that you're doing that you don't want to do anymore. Um, and we uh, combine outsourcing and automation to run it, scale it, and bring down prices over time through automation. That's cool. So now I've, I've met a ton of business owners. This is a really interesting time of life and business when... So we've kind of like evolved as a society, right? So we've had like this subscription-based service for a long, like services for a long time. So like, you know, you used to buy music, like you used to buy CDs and then they digitize everything. And then you bought digital albums and you just bought them, right? And now we have Apple Music and Spotify and, and the list goes on for things that we've like, you know, subscription-based models, right? And now it's kind of like trickled into business. And it's not, I don't think it's a bad thing, but it's just very interesting, like, fractional COO services, fractional CMO services, you know, like companies who are just starting, who can't hire teams, they look to companies like yours, right? I'm assuming to like kind of take over these parts. And so I'm just curious, like what got you into that? And, and how has it, how has like you, how have you seen this industry kind of change the way businesses are doing business now? Yeah. Um, so as I said, ops is a service the concept of X as a service um, means that you don't need to build X internally anymore. You no longer have to think about it. Um, so every business is really two businesses. There's the thing about your business that's unique that only you do. And then there's all the things you do that every other business has to do too, where you're reinventing the wheel. And invisible means that you no longer have to reinvent the wheel on operations. Like we are best practice on, on that. Um, and um we're, you know, actually what's interesting, if you get into a more nuanced business model analysis, it's actually not a SaaS product. Invisible is usage-based, kind of like AWS, Amazon Web Services, um, one of the best, biggest businesses in the world, actually, um, where uh, a startup won't build their own servers. They will rent servers from Amazon, but they don't pay a single price. Like on Spotify, let's just say you pay $10 a month and you get unlimited Spotify. Um, and that's the way most SaaS works. And the reason why most SaaS works is there's zero marginal cost um, for Spotify to stream a million artists to you versus a hundred artists to you. Or if you, a hundred hours of songs versus a thousand hours of songs costs Spotify identical amounts. Um, but um, for Amazon, they got to spin servers up and down. So you actually pay a unit price. Um, so the way I think about Invisible is um, we're disrupting the dinosaur of traditional outsourcing. Uh, outsourcing companies bill you by the hour, let's say $20 an hour. So what's their incentive? Their incentive is to bill you as many hours as possible. <laughs> yeah, so they want to yeah. be as, they want to be as inefficient as possible without getting fired. Um, and uh, that's the way they're going to maximize their revenue. Um, but we bill by the unit. Um, so let's just say you're an insurance company and you have us processing claims. Uh, or you're an airline and you have us submitting reports to the FAA, or you're DoorDash or, uh, and you have us digitizing restaurant menus. Um, these processes will have a unit price attached to them. If we can get more efficient, uh, if we can automate, um, that allows us to increase our margins and lower unit prices to you and disrupt our competition. Um, and uh, it's just like a, a fundamentally like a win-win uh, thing that aligns incentives where everyone's incentive is aligned around efficiency and deflation. And in an inflationary world where everything's getting more expensive, um, you get less with more money. 
um, you know, deflation is better, faster, cheaper. It's about getting more with less money, more with less as like efficiency. So, um, you know, we think that's the future and, and we're excited about it. Yeah. I well, And you bring up a good point because a lot of us get kind of stuck. And like you said, and where you're like, you have to be, uh, you know, the, the traditional model for like any kind of, yeah. Cause I used to do like, um, I used to own a virtual assisting company. Right. And it was like that. We just build by the hour because like, I didn't know like how long this would take or whatever. Right. Um, the way that I tried to disrupt that VA world was just like packages. Right. So like we gave you 10 hours and if we could do something quicker in 10 hours, like, you know, faster than 10 hours, then it was like, all right, cool. Then we won. You got, you know, you got it for quicker and we did it for less. Right. Like, um, and so that seemed to work. And then, you know, and then we kind of ran into problems with like, Hey, I have so many hours left. And so, and that was probably just me not managing expectations very well, but it seems like um, it's hard for a lot of people to get out of that mindset of like paying by the hour. Right. So how do you like navigate those conversations with clients of like, um, you know, just like efficiency, right? Like how do you sell efficiency, I guess? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... So uh, every business has processes. You may not realize you have processes, but whether um, you know, there's different things that your sales team is doing, your marketing team is doing, uh, your data science team is doing, building a data set, um, yeah, your ops team, like you've got all these different workflows that are happening and it's repetitive instruction-based work. And when you have a college degree, you should be solving you know, you should be doing things that are creative and complex and strategic, and um, and and that's what that's what's the best use of your time. That's the most productive use of your time. So whenever you're you're doing repetitive digital instruction based work, you should immediately like delegate it. The problem is it's very hard to delegate it. So we've made it like really easy. You can literally go on a Zoom call and screen share and show us and just talk to us. Yeah. Um, and if you can explain it uh, the way you'd explain it to me, um, and if I can understand it then we can map your process for you. Um, and we do that for free as just part of the service. Um, you know, uh, and then once we've mapped your processes, we break them into little steps. So one of the questions our clients have is all the time is, well, our company's processes are unique. You know, I'm a unique, I'm a unique snowflake. You know, it's all, and, it, and it's true, it's all custom work. But even though our clients are giving us custom processes, we're breaking them into standard steps like Legos. Um, and once you know you have a, a standard step, if you automate that step, then any other company that ever has that same step gets the benefit of that automation. So we're building this step library, and I almost think of it like sequencing the enterprise process genome, where you know uh, let's just say there's like. 10 companies that are competing in a space. Like uh, you got DoorDash and Uber Eats and Grubhub, for example. Yeah. They're all going to do their processes in unique ways. But if you can break them into steps and figure out how to automate those steps, then everybody benefits. Um, and it's one of those things where, um, you know, you, you actually have to combine um, this mixture of uh, things that are, can be done with software and things that are still manual enough and very difficult to automate. And, you know, there's a, there's an app for everything. There's like so many tools, uh, tech companies love making new tools, um, but the, tool, <laughs> the customers want solutions. They don't want tools. They want hundred percent solutions, not a 2% tool and another 3% tool and a 5% tool. And then, you know, they have 80% of the work left to do themselves. Yeah. Like, so in, invisible is a, a hybrid model that combines, uh, it's tech and it's, it's services. It's not a product. Um, so we combine the pure software with the manual component. We have a thousand workers on our digital assembly line um, oh, wow. that are doing the steps that we can't automate. So that allows us to, to, to deliver an end-to-end -end run. Wow, that's crazy. So now let's get into like, um, I mean, I have more questions about that, but more importantly, is this something, you know, your, your company that you have now, is this something that you have always wanted to do? Is this something that you planned on or did it fall into your lap or, or by, you know what I mean? Cause some of the stories I get are like, Oh no, this just happened. Like, I don't know how. And, uh, and so yeah. others, it was like really intentional. So I'm just curious, uh, your story. Um, it's a bit of both. Uh, I, I think that I I've come to have a belief in destiny or fate because life is very <laughs> strange and it unfolds in ways that you could never predict, yeah. but, but I definitely, you know, you definitely have plans and those plans shape things. So <laughs> my story, my story is, um, 
it goes like this. I, um, I have been studying uh, the classics, um, books by dead people, history, philosophy, <laughs> economics, um, uh, since I was like a, a young, when I was, when I was about 12. Um, and uh, when I went to school, um, uh, I didn't realize that I, I was going to become an entrepreneur, um, but I had an idea at one point and uh, I decided to do it after I graduated. Uh, and my first company uh, was an iPhone app um, like Instagram, but for your goals. Um, and we had half a million people use it and um, uh, we got all these design awards. People love the product, but after about six months, everybody quit. Just like everyone quits going to the gym after six months. Um, and, uh, and so, so the business model failed and my first company failed. Um, and, uh, then I like, you know, traveled for a few months and tried to get my head straight and I had all these job offers. Uh, and I, and I just knew that I had another company in me, um, but I didn't know what to do next. Um, so I asked all my friends, Hey, do you, you know, do you have any startup ideas? You don't have time to start. And they share their ideas. And I publish one a day over email to my friends and, and we would just discuss them. So for about a year, um, I was thinking about, you know, uh, which of these ideas should I do next? And then I had that realization, oh, you know, there's an app for everything, but nobody's got the time to use it. Um, and that's why, you know, like uh, we, um, uh, even though there's an app for everything, everything's not perfect yet. So, right. <laughs> uh, so if Uber drives cars for you, who's going to drive apps for you? Um, and uh, I realized that, oh, you know, there's uh, a whole automation industry, but, but these, these are also just more tools. So um, what if there was um, outsourcing and automation in one end-to-end -end solution? But even then, um, Dalton, my first uh, business model for Invisible failed. Um, the first business model was like, uh, a $10,000 a month executive support service where you could delegate, you know, uh, if you're a busy CEO, you could delegate purchasing flights, scheduling meetings, things like that. Um, and uh, we didn't have um, any like overseas workers. We didn't have a digital assembly line. Um, and uh, we were trying to do it ourselves. So we spent $20,000 a month for every 10K we were getting in revenue. It was very unprofitable. <laughs> um, and um and then um, we ended up just pivoting and iterating our way to, to realizing, oh, business process outsourcing and automation is the business model. And if you unitize the pricing and you combine um, like uh, uh, processes with automation, with um, well-coordinated uh, labor, then you can actually do this and disrupt traditional uh, outsourcing and pure software automation. That journey took like a few years. It wasn't until um, probably like 2018, 2019 that the business model started working. And it wasn't until 2020 that the business model started scaling. Um, so it was almost like, you know, a 10 year entrepreneurial journey before, um, before I knew I wasn't a crazy person. Uh, <laughs> and, um, but um when we got to say a million dollar revenue run rate in January, 2020 to today, um, where we're nearly at a $20 uh, million dollar revenue run rate, um, we've been more than tripling uh, on, a, on an annual basis on, on the top line and we're profitable. And so um, it's, it's, uh, it's incredible when things work, how quickly uh, they can scale. Um, and so uh, it, it sort of has, um, you know, on a personal level, you go through these intense doubts, doubts in your own ability, doubts, doubts whether your, your strategy is right, your ideas are right. Um, and, um, and then, you know, when you see that faith rewarded, uh, it's really, really encouraging. Yeah, no kidding. You said 10 years is how is the, the journey you've been on right now, huh? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, what, for you, what was like, what, what kept you going, I guess? um faith i think um yeah and um you know on some level you are betting on yourself and you're betting on um the the logic uh uh and and the ideas themselves um and i felt like a kind of responsibility to the ideas like the ideas were these like um beautiful 
um, children almost that, uh, that like, if I just nurtured the children, they would grow up to be these amazing, like <laughs> things for like forces in the world. Yeah, um, yeah. and I did, I didn't want to like abandon the children, you know? Um, and, <laughs> yeah, I love that. <laughs> um, uh, and so you, you develop this mindset where, um, when, when things aren't working, you take responsibility for them, even if they feel like, even if it seems like they're outside of your power or outside of your control. So, mm -hmm. you know, if an investor rejects you, you, instead of just saying, okay, that investor's stupid, you say, <laughs> well, like, what can I learn from this, right? And you're, you're always, it felt like for, for so many years, I was putting a white belt on every single day. Um, <laughs> and um, and uh, you're, you're really in a beginner's mind. So it's very, very, very humbling uh, process. Um, and, uh, but then, you know, um, things started to click, um, and, um, and yeah, here we are. There you go. And, and as things start to click, I think that's when, that's when you, you mentioned earlier, right. You're like, you know, like you start realizing like, you're not crazy, like things are working. And I, and I, I just love that whole idea. I love that you started in your story, you know, you started with, um, this kind of high ticket offer that was kind of going toward, you know, two high level executives. Cause that's another thing. Like if you kind of, you know, I have my ear to the ground in a few different like, uh, industries and things like that. And high ticket coaching is like one of these crazy things that people are, are gravitating towards and not necessarily like high ticket coaching, but also just like other high ticket offers, you know, the 10 K 20 K a month things. Um, what, you know, when you started unitizing things, I mean, obviously you were talking about how like um, the structure wasn't perfect, but I, I'm, I'm curious, was there anything else like in that, you know, 10K offer that you guys were doing that you made you think like, maybe we could, maybe we should switch this. Like, was there anything, were there any cons to like other cons to like the, the this, these high ticket offers? Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, my, my first company, as I mentioned, uh, was like an Instagram for your goals. It was called yeah. Everest and it was a free, it was a free social network. Um, and the nice thing about free is that, um, you know, it's, everybody can download it. Uh, and, and, um, yeah. it was, it was, it was an app. So there was like zero marginal cost for additional users. Um, but, um, the implication is it's not very valuable. Uh, each, you know, you're not you're not creating a ton of value for each user. It's not like every user who's downloading it is getting like a thousand dollars of value and they're paying zero dollars. Um, <laughs> you know, it's sort of the implication is that like, you know, hopefully they get more value out of the app than they paid for it, but they paid zero for it. So even if they get ten dollars of value out of the app, like, like it's good. So it's sort of if you create a spectrum, it's sort of like high scale, low value. And then on the other end of the spectrum, um, you have like uh, the Tesla Roadster or something, the very first Tesla car, which was extremely expensive. Um, uh, and you had Invisible's first business model, also extremely expensive. Like how many people can afford $10,000 a month for a futuristic executive support service? You know, yeah, not a lot. Small, small market, but the implication is if you're going to pay $10,000 a month, you're getting way more than $10,000 a month of value. So it's extremely valuable, but extremely unscalable, right? And um, and whichever end of the spectrum you end up on, you're trying to go the other way. Um, so if you're starting with the like, you know, so, uh, solving for value first and scale yeah. second, then, okay, you're like, okay, great. I created, I went from zero to one. I created something that was extremely valuable for somebody. Um, but now I need to figure out how to scale it and make it something that everybody, everybody can, can have. Um, and then if you go the other, on the other, start on the other side, you start with something that's like extremely scalable, but questionably <laughs> valuable. And you got to figure out how to make it valuable. Right. Um, yeah. so, um, so that it was, it was a really good way to, to get to have a more honest conversation when you have somebody who's spending a lot of money on your service every month, they will tell you, uh, what you're, what's not working. Um, uh, they will give you feedback and you'll get, you'll get, uh, there's like an honesty in that transaction, right? Uh, you can't hide from, um, you know, your, your business model. Whereas if you're like <laughs> losing money uh, and, and raising money from investors and, and you have a bunch of free users, it's actually kind of hard to get signal. Right. Oh yeah. That's uh, what is it? 
up in the tech world they i mean not anymore with the with the way the world is going but like they had that saying for a long time though i was like red is the new black or whatever in in the tech world it was just like people were throwing money at these companies who hadn't seen black and for you know what i mean the black and forever yeah. It's just why I don't know. That's just one that's kind of close. Like here in Utah, we have a lot of those budding tech companies and budding VCs trying to all make their name and 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 forge their way into the world. And so, yeah, that that one hit kind of close. is is kind of crazy, but um, it, it's it's super uh, it's super interesting to talk about just how you scaling companies. But for you, even before your first company, did you is this did you always want to go into business? Was entrepreneurial ventures always on your radar? Um, I always wanted to make a huge impact. Um, okay. And it definitely seemed clear that the best way to do that in the world was to start your own company. Um, uh, and I, I sort of tried other things. Uh, like in college, I um, was day trading for a while in the stock market and trying to you know think about what would it be That's like to fun. be an investor? <laughs> the, problem, the problem with being an investor is you don't get to actually like build stuff. Um, you're, you're getting a secondary value. You're getting, when other people create value, you're, you're owning some of that value and you're collecting some of that value, but you're not creating value. So it's not as creative. Um, at least that was my judgment. Um, and if you're a consultant, uh, you're recommending solutions, but if you recommend 10 solutions and then your client only implements one, um, you know, you're not really getting to test your ideas. Um, and, um, you know, if you're a journalist, you know, you're, um, uh, you're helping surface stories and, and, and generate insights in the world, but you're fundamentally an observer. You're not like yeah. literally a doer and, and doing things. Um, and, um, uh, and if you're a politician, um, <laughs> you're, you're often operating within these very complicated industrial complexes and, and, and uh, bureaucratic complexes where you have all these agency problems. So, um, you know, you don't, really have the ability to like unilaterally take action um and it's very very hard to like you make all these compromises and it's very hard to amass enough power to make effective change yeah. um but as an entrepreneur um you know you you have much more agency and you're much more of a captain of your own destiny now it's funny you mentioned this profitability question because um if you raise a bunch of money from VCs, the, the average tech company that raises venture capital ends up with 70% of the company owned by investors, 20% of the company owned by the management team, and 10% of the company owned by everybody else. Yeah. Um, and the company ends up being controlled by the investors. So right. in, theory, in theory, a lot of entrepreneurs start so they can be their own boss and be, <laughs> be the captain of their own destiny um, and, uh, and, have control, and have creative control. And then very quickly they they um, they sell out, and um, and oftentimes it doesn't actually work out well for them. But even when it does work out well for them, it's a very different um, it's a very different bargain. Um, and so uh, I really care about this word sovereignty, uh, and sovereignty combines ownership and control. And so um, if you think about like the spectrum from bootstrapping to um, raising venture capital for capital intensive business, like say SpaceX, where mm -hmm. it looks like what I just described. There's a third option, which is building a capital efficient business, which gets to profitability in less than 10 years with less than $10 million. And if, you're, if you have a, a business that does require some capital, but is fundamentally capital efficient, um, you, um, by definition, the labor is creating most of the value. So the labor should have most of the equity ownership. Yeah. Um, so, so it should be mostly owned by the team, not mostly owned by the investors. And you should maintain control. Um, and if you build that type of business, you don't have to IPO. You don't have to sell that company. You don't have to go from the series A to the series B to the series C. You know, you can actually just build a profitable, scalable, defensible monopoly that is sovereign and it's yours for the long run. And it feels like a more you know, uh, a traditional way of doing business, but in a way it's kind of retro futuristic. I think this is, <laughs> this is going to be, I think more and more people are going to go in this direction of building capital efficient, sovereign companies. Yeah, absolutely. Like we've got, like, ultimately we've gone full circle, like this, what you're describing, because like, that's a traditional way to build a business, right? Like you bootstrap it. It takes a long time. 
you know, you focus on profitability, you reinvest and then you, and then you grow, right? Like there's this snowball effect that takes time. Right. And VC is kind of like that. It's just that quick injection, right. Of like, can we get, you know, can we uh, go viral in a year versus can we be stable for 10 kind of thing? It reminds me of like, this whole idea reminds me of like the streaming thing that we have going on with TV right now, where like it started with Netflix and now we have 15 and now people are like, is there a service that combines all of those streaming services? And then we can just flip through and I'm old enough. I'm like, you mean like dish TV or like direct TV or something like that? You know what I mean? And so it's just like, we've gone full circle in this whole thing, right? It is, um, it, it is full circle. So I think of it as almost like uh, counterclockwise versus clockwise. Okay. So every, right. every, it seems like the tech industry by and large is playing what I'll call the clockwise game, uh, the venture game, which is um, you, you start a company, you raise money, you spend the money on product and growth to create enterprise value. So you run losses, not profits. Um, then uh, if you've created enough value with the losses, you raise a series B, you lose more money, um, and, uh, and then hopefully create more value in the process. And then you raise a series C and you spend even more money and lose more money and hopefully create value in the process. Then you either IPO or you sell. That's the clockwise game. The counterclockwise game is you generate profit. You start a company, you generate profits. Um, those profits generate borrowing power with debt, not equity. You use the debt to buy out your investors. Um, and you use that equity that you you then have a lot of to motivate your team you give the equity to the team the team generates more performance which generates more profits which generates more borrowing power uh which gives you more <laughs> debt which you can use to completely buy out your investors and then when you're 100 percent owned by the team everyone's really motivated so they create more profits um and uh which generates yeah, that's more a good point power. to mention yeah. and then and then you actually start buying other companies you're no yeah. you're not talking about selling to the companies you're now on the other side of the transaction you're the one buying the companies um and and so the clockwise game is powered by equity capital the counterclockwise game is powered by profits and debt capital um and yeah, that's a good uh, point to mention too. There's a difference between how to raise money between, you know, raising equity and, and just, and finding debt. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I like how you put that though. I mean, debt is, I mean, that's how I chose to fund a, a few of my companies. There was an equity option and a debt option. And I don't know, it's just feels better to, I know it sounds weird, but, and this is the game. I'm just going to put a caveat on this. There's a difference between personal finance and business finance, right? That's right. But like debt is a little more appealing than equity financing when you're looking Not at Not a little that. more appealing, vastly more appealing. So I'm going to try to illustrate this with a, a simple story. Um, let's say you think you're going to build an incredible company and you want to raise money and you raise $10 million at $100 million valuation. And you think, wow, I'm so amazing. This is so great. Um, uh, and then you succeed and you turn your $100 million company into a $10 billion company. That $10 million that you raised now costs a billion dollars, but it's not paid off. They still own 10% of your company. So if you turn your $10 billion company into a $100 billion company, that billion turns into 10 billion and it's still not paid off. It still owns 10% of your company. You sold 10% ownership. If you took that 10 million in high yield debt at a 20% interest, only let's say 8% of that would be in cash interest and the rest would be in pick interest, which is non-cash, just compounds. Let's just say it's 20% interest on $10 million. In five years, that 10 million turns into 25 million. 25 million is 40 times cheaper than a billion dollars. <laughs> so you would have reduced your cost of capital by 40 X. And at the end of the time period, you would have either repaid it or refinanced it. So it'd be gone. Um, yeah. And the equity is never gone. So most people wow. Oh, wow. That's understand so interesting. that you, if, you could, if you can borrow debt, if you become profitable, and then generate borrowing power and use that, use that to take debt and buy back equity, mm -hmm. you are swapping out unlimited upside equity with limited upside debt. And I'll pause there and then I can give you one more illustration. Uh, but does that make sense? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And this is very interesting because I'm just finishing up some school, like I'm finishing up my MBA and, and, uh, and I, so I got my degree in accounting and finance and finishing that in finance. And I have always been in that camp. That's like, why would we go for equity? Like they will loan, like a bank will loan us money. And they're like, well, why would we take out a loan? Like debt's bad. And I'm like, well, I don't think so. 
like i'm glad you corrected me because i've always just pitched it I'm like it's a little bit better like that but you're like it's a lot better and i'm learning so this is great it's so like yeah, it, keep going. it's this like infinitely great. better here's yeah. another game all right dalton so suppose you and i own a business together 50 50 okay. and i offer you um five million dollars to buy out your stake you get five million dollar payday which is amazing sure like I'll see you on a yacht in Europe. Bye. Um, okay. And uh, so great. You got $5 million, but now I got hundred percent of the business. Let's just say the business goes from being worth 10 million to being worth a hundred million. Okay. Now, instead of only growing my stake from 5 million of the $10 million business to uh, 50 million of the hundred million dollar business, which would be 45 million of gain. Um, I've now grown my stake from a hundred percent of a $10 million business to a hundred percent of a hundred million dollar business. So I've had 90 million of gain and I've paid 5 million for it. So I got 85 million of gain instead of 45 million of gain between the two scenarios. Now who's looking, now who has the last laugh? <laughs> yeah, that's so true, huh? Yeah, Ooh. yeah. Um, and so, yeah, people, you know, finance, uh, if we call, we have to do a class at Invisible, we call it Finance 101. Okay. And, um, even if you're not on the finance team, everybody at the company has to take it. Um, and the reason that we do this is yeah. I didn't get an MBA. Nobody taught me this stuff. I had to learn the hard way in the school of hard knocks, but it's actually not that complicated. But finance people want you to think it's complicated. Why? <laughs> hey, you know what? I'll pause you. That's absolutely true. Yeah. They, they throw words at you and they try to like, yeah, yes. And I, yeah. yes, that's so it's, true. It's, you got to just check it, dude. You're like, no, this is super paternalistic, not. super condescending, super snobby. You know, yes. Um, I'm like, shut they, up. You guys they walk, they, they walk around with their Ivy League degrees, elitists, and like, you know, they use all these complicated acronyms like CAGR and IRR and they try to confuse you. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, but, uh, <laughs> I love it, by the way. I totally agree with you 100%. I'm on your side. <laughs> but the benefit of having the benefit, if you, if you're, let's just imagine like you're playing poker with somebody who doesn't know how to play poker. Like when you have somebody on the other side of the table who's financially illiterate and you're financially illiterate, you're going to arbitrage that illiteracy. Like you're going to make money because they don't know what, what game they're playing. And, uh, and so um, we try to uh, like create hundred percent financial literacy at our company so that we can have a much more adult conversation about risk. Um, and we expect everybody to think like the CFO. Um, and, uh, and so there's, there's basic things we've learned along the way. Like, here's an example, equity turns into money in one of five ways, dividends, you use profits to pay people out. Yeah. Secondaries, some other outside investor buys out an inside shareholder pay you know pays for their shares so they it's a it's a transaction between two shareholders an outsider and an insider um an ipo you uh you you basically sell a percentage of your company to the world and, and anyone in the whole world can buy um uh, an m a transa transaction an acquisition you yep. sell your company to another company uh, and all the shareholders are bought out by the new company and then lastly buybacks the company buys back shares from shareholders. Um, when we got to profitability, I had sold over 40% of the company to our investors, but I'd maintained control. Uh, and so I went to our investors and I said, hey, we're not going to raise another equity round. We're not going to raise a series A. Um, we're not going to IPO. We're not going to sell. Uh, we're not going to issue dividends. We're not going to facilitate a secondary, but we will buy you out. Um, and, uh, and we've got some debt to do it. Are you interested in selling? So last year we bought back 13 and a half percent for $5 million. Um, and, uh, and we took out in debt and we gave that 13 and a half percent back to the team, which then made them more motivated to create more performance. And this year we're trying to buy back much more. Um, and, uh, and hopefully, you know, uh, get to as high as 80% ownership by the team. And we're going to take on a lot more debt to do it, but, um, you know, we're doing, we're doing, we're pursuing buybacks as like an exit mechanism. But the nice thing about buybacks is that it really extends your time horizon because most, yeah. most VC back startups are just thinking about the IPO or the acquisition and they want to like, yeah. it's like a five to seven year long time horizon. But when you're doing buybacks, you have an infinite time horizon. You can think in terms of decades because there's no there's no artificial end date where it's all the game is over. Yeah, no, that's so. I, I love that you mentioned that. Um, 
there's just a lot to unpack there. A lot, a lot of good things for business owners in that, because if you're, if they're looking at that, so if you were going to bootstrap a company, you would, you would just as soon, I mean, obviously you would, you would just start like having a product that people wanted to pay for. You'd start reinvesting. And then the next thing you would do is probably just go grab a, grab some kind of loan with whatever buying power you have. Yep. Yeah. Versus like grabbing partners and, and throwing in equity. Well, you know, we're giving our equity to the team, but we've done a special deal with the team where, okay. um, so on, so equity, when you get equity at most startups, like a lot of, a lot of good people are very skeptical about equity, right? Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, I'm sure they've been at a company before <laughs> that prom promised them the equity would be worth something <laughs> and the equity ended up being worth nothing, right? So you kind of look at it as snake oil, you know, there's some snake oil salesman, um, you know, offering me this, this stuff that's valuable in paper. So I'm a, I'm a millionaire on paper, but when is it actually going to turn into something? Yeah. Um, and that's because in a venture game, you have a massively loss making company. And the only way the equity turns into money is in that IPO or M&A, which is very uncertain and many years in the future. Right. But if you've got a profitable company, risk is lower. Um, and then secondly, it's easier to value the company uh, based on sort of a fundamental analysis of the financials. And then lastly, if you're doing buybacks every year, then uh, you can have liquidity, which is big. You can, you can decide to sell at any time. So our partners at Invisible, if you're on the team here and you've got equity here, starting next year, you can sell in our annual buyback. Um, and that means that like, hey, you know, you're not just a millionaire on paper. You could uh, you could sell, and um, it's up to you whether you want to do that or you want want to hold. But it comes with a condition, which is that if you leave the company, if you quit your job, um, and uh, you can hold on to your stock for a maximum period of three years before the company has a call option to buy you out at that year's buyback. Yeah, um, which allows us to keep recycling the equity back into the hands of the people at the company. So, um, Oh, you know, wow. That's in, you wow. That's you don't right. become a, you don't become a gerontocracy where it's like, who owns the company? Uh, people who invested 10 years ago, people who used to work here 10 years ago. No, no, no. The uh, as close to hundred percent of the company is in the hands of the people working at the company today, creating the value today. Wow. That's not true, even at the best companies like Apple, you know, the vast majority of Apple, I, I would be surprised if more than 10% of Apple is owned by Apple employees. I would be surprised if even 5% of Apple is owned by Apple employees. The yeah. vast majority of Apple is owned by random people. <laughs> um, who, who, yeah, and, longtime investors or people outside of the company. Yeah, yeah who are not creating value directly. Um, and so... What would happen if 100% of Apple was owned by Apple employees? Like it would, it yeah. would yield incredible alignment, <laughs> motivational alignment. You, your incentive would be to care about the long-term, uh, you know, creation of value for the company. That's yeah, the that, idea. that's interesting. So, what would you like if somebody was? Uh, let's just hypothetical, right? Um, if you if somebody came up to you, debt versus equity, would you rather do equity or would you rather give debt? Um, I will debt, yeah. no yeah. questions asked, you know, sort of all <laughs> else being equal debt, but it's obviously this question of what terms, right? Oh, sure. Um, okay. Yeah. That's so, fair. <laughs> so, so, so if somebody was willing to offer me equity, uh, at a trillion dollar valuation, <laughs> um, uh, with, uh, with, the, with, you know, I don't know, I can think about what other terms there are like complete control and the ability to create new shares, then like, I'll take the equity <laughs> versus the debt, but the debt is at a hundred percent interest rate. Right. So like <laughs> all else being equal, sure. uh, I have a preference for debt. Yeah. Um, you, so somebody came up and like, they were looking for, you know, your involvement in the company. You just be like, I'll just, here's the money. We're going to do a debt agreement or whatever. If, um, that's you cool. Know, I good. like that. That's cool. It depends on the underlying strategy and sure. structure of the company. So for example, if you're starting SpaceX, right? SpaceX is a capital intensive company that sort of needs to lose money for a long, long time before it will ever make money. So yeah. SpaceX should raise equity, not debt, because That's you can't, for, you can't foreclose on the equity, but you can, uh, but if you're, if you have a profitable company, then debt is almost always cheaper than uh, than equity, um, and uh, and and comes with less strings attached. There's also this question, Dalton, of like the literal structure of the deal. Yeah. So, for example, in debt, 
you know, for example, if you raise a Series A, an equity round, not a debt round, you can't really refinance your Series A. Uh, you can't go back to the investors <laughs> later and say like, uh, hey, you know, we're, we're, um, we're swapping you out with cheaper money. Um, uh, so, but if you raise, if you raise expensive debt, let's just say you have debt at a 20% interest rate yeah. and then, uh, and you're, because your risk is relatively high. So people are relatively unwilling to lend to you. Um, then, you know, your business performs very, very well. Um, you know, two or three years later, you can go back and raise more money at a lower interest rate. Let's just say it's 10% interest rate. Yeah. And then suddenly you refinance out the 20% interest rate and you've lowered your cost of capital. And then in a few more years, you perform and you lower risk again, and you can raise even more money on an even lower interest rate. Suddenly you're raising money at a 5% interest rate. So you're constantly able to refinance debt. That's a key thing. Another key thing is distinguishing between uh, cash interest and, and non-cash interest, which is called PIC interest, payment in kind interest. So, yeah. and, and then maturity. So if you have very long maturity or very short maturity debt, it changes the value. So for example, if I say, I'm gonna loan you hundred dollars, but it's due in one minute, <laughs> then you can't really do much with the hundred dollars. Yeah. But if I tell you, hey, I'm gonna loan you hundred dollars, it's due in a hundred years, you can do a lot with that hundred dollars and pay me <laughs> back in, in hundred years. Um, yeah. And so the, the, the utility of the loan increases as the maturity increases. Yeah. Um, and, the, um, and then the cash uh, interest versus non-cash is key too. If it's a zero cash interest loan, um, but it's compounding at 20%, then it turns into two, you know, it's a 2.5x in five years for the lender. Um, uh, that's what 20% does in five years, uh -huh. 2.5x's. But in, the, in those five years, you haven't had to pay any interest payments. So you can use your cash flows to keep reinvesting in your business. So if your business is going to go into 10x in five years, then you know, you've you've got a yeah. spread of 0.5x. Um, so these are, you know, you have to get to the point where you can, um, uh, I'm sure that for a lot of your listeners, they're like, whoa, their head is spinning. <laughs> like, yeah, so all, yeah. But actually, you know, it's really not that complicated. And if you take the time to learn it, um, it's, it's the sort of thing where 10, 20, 30 hours of, of learning can get you to a place where, you know, your, your long-term outcome in your career, your financial outcome is going to be like night and day different. There's probably yeah. not, there's probably not going to be a better way you could spend 10 to 30 hours learning anything than learning this. <laughs> yeah. Learning how business finance works hundred yeah. percent. Well, hundred yeah. percent. I mean, that's like why, even though I'm not like an accountant, I'm not going into finance. Like I learned that because even in sales, like, like you mentioned earlier, why everybody takes finance one-on-one in your company. Right. And that's because like, everybody needs to know like what we're talking about when we're, when we're talking about money, like I deal with business owners and franchises and wh whoever else all day. And if like, I can't have an intelligent conversation about money, like it's pretty hard for me to have conversations at all. Right. And so, yeah, everybody should know that for sure. I, I attended that. Yeah. I attended yeah. a college where, yeah, accounting 101 and finance 101 were required to graduate. <laughs> you couldn't. Like, yeah. It, but I mean, going back to school memories, um, I always had to work really hard to get A's in my math classes. And uh, I always felt very shy about my math abilities. And I always thought that I was just bad at it. Um, and, uh, and, and the reality is that like um, the math I did in even in high school is much more complicated than any math I do today running this business. Um, and, uh, and I just think people are just intimidated. You won't believe the financial illiteracy, not only that I had, like a year ago, I knew nothing about debt. And now I've learned a lot, but I still have a lot more to learn. But the rea when I interview people, for example, interviewing finance candidates, um, senior yeah. executives, sometimes you've got somebody who's worked on Wall Street, who's been a senior finance executive at like major organization. Um, uh, and and uh, they won't be able to walk you through uh, the structure of an income statement. They don't, they won't be able to say, okay, there's revenue. You subtract COGS, you get gross margins, you subtract growth costs, you get contribution <laughs> margins, you subtract GNA and R and D, you get operating margins, you subtract interest and, um, uh, and taxes. You get net margins. <laughs> yeah. Like they won't be able to explain that to you, which is right. shocking. So I think actually most, most CEOs, including most tech CEOs, 
Um, and even a lot of finance people, including a lot of VCs, are not as financially literate as you might think, or even as yeah, they yeah, think. As you think. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and, and really, if, you, if there's literally just a very few books that can give you like an introduction to this, that very, very quickly you can learn a lot. Like one of those books that's just like a, a golden key um, is, uh, is Outsiders by William Thorndike. Blew my mind, changed my perspective forever. Another book um, is Seven Powers by Helmer. Here it is. Um, okay. This is a book about business model defensibility. Um, and um, <laughs> That's cool. That's yeah, cool. yeah. Um, and, uh, like why did Netflix kill blockbuster? Um, you know, uh, fundamental business model strategy. Yeah. I heard, uh, I heard that story about blockbuster. Someone said they'd ran like a, they ran like when Netflix was coming on the scene, blockbuster ran like a survey and with like their customers and like internally and stuff. And they said like people, they were, that blockbuster was going to beat Netflix because people liked the the ambiance of going to Blockbuster on Friday and running into like their friends and stuff. And it's like, uh, who did you interview, man? Cause like, don't get me wrong. Like I, I thought that was great. Like going to the video store on Friday and, and like seeing people and having fun, but it's also like, have you wanted to watch a movie and been able to watch it in one minute and not have to do any kind of planning. And if you, you know what I mean? It's like, that's just but see, wild. That, that, you know, you know that now because you're living in the future, and you know That's that true. you can watch for a minute. But this is before streaming ever existed. Yeah, so you're right. Um, and but you're right. You're right that there was a cognitive bias. Like yeah. <laughs> when 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 you're being disrupted, the first thing is to deny that there's a threat, and the second thing is to like ridicule and be like, ah, oh, these guys, you know, they're just they don't know what they're doing, or they think they uh, they think they're hot shit. And then the next step is to be very afraid. And the next step is to be angry. And the last step is to capitulate and surrender. And, and they went bankrupt in 2011. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but literally, you know, only less than 10 years before, like seven years before, they were the market leader and they were a multi-billion dollar company. Yeah, that's what a, what a crazy story. That's cool. Really appreciate your story. Really appreciate the book reviews uh, or uh, the book recommendations and really grateful for your time. So if somebody wants to get involved with everything going on at invisible, how do they get a hold of you? How do they find you? How do they follow yeah. you? Yeah. Our company website is invisible. I N V I S I B L E dot co not dot com. That last <laughs> M will be very expensive. Um, <laughs> yeah. invisible dot co. And then, uh, to find me, I'm on LinkedIn, Francis Pedraza, F R A N C I S p-e-d-r-a-z-a -A, francis pedraza and um if you shoot me a message um i'll know you're not a random salesperson or bot if you include a quote by a dead person uh and then i'll <laughs> respond to you oh that's so awesome i love that all right francis well i appreciate you coming thank you so much for being here cheers dalton this was great absolutely